If you love playing attacking chess and you want to learn a simple universal opening that you can play against pretty much any moves of your opponent, then you've come to the right place. Grandmaster Igor Spirinov and let's go ahead and get started. I'm talking about an improved version of the Black Mar Demur Gambit. But first of all, what is the Black Mar Demur Gambit? Well, you start off with pawn e4, pawn e5 is the most common response, and then instead of c4, the Queen's Gambit, you're gambiting another pawn by playing pawn e4. Black captures it, now knight c3 is attacking this pawn, black defends it, and now you play f3, seeking quick development and attack. So that's the classical black mardimer. For example, after a pawn takes queen recaptures, it leads to a very interesting game. And, you know, in the past I used to think that it's not that good and with a few correct moves black would refute this easily, but as I analyzed it deeper it turned out that it's actually a dangerous opening weapon and it's certainly not easy for black to deal with it. In fact, I've got another video about this black mardimer gambit, which you may check out later. But today I've noticed that uh, actually you've got an improved version of the black mardimer gambit if you just play, instead of f3, if you just play bishop g5 first then you're getting essentially the same position, but even in a better version. So let me show you why this bishop g5 is so cool move, and actually very often you're going to just win the game right away, right out of the opening after most natural, most played moves by black. Now here on the right bottom side you can see the statistics of moves, and the most played moves are at the top. So if you start off with pawn d4, most of your pawns will respond to pawn d5, then clearly Pawn e4 is not the most common move, but we're gonna play it anyway. Pretty much everyone will capture the pawn, then you play knight c3, and again, pretty much the only like most meaningful response of black is knight f6. And here we're gonna go bishop g5. And as you can see that the majority of your pawns will play this move bishop to f5. And the second most common move is pawn e6, which is actually quite pointless, because if black does that, they're actually exposing themselves to this pin. And you can just go ahead and take this pawn and put even more pressure onto this knight. Therefore, the second most played move of black is definitely not dangerous for you at all. And when black goes bishop f5, you can now get back to the black mardimer gambit by playing pawn f3, and here an advantage of this is that, again, most of your pawns will capture here, and after that, when you recapture, not only you get the same position, but now you're also attacking these two targets, and therefore you're bringing up your queen with a tempo, and now just look at this. Most of your opponents are actually about to drop their bishop back to c8, which is quite ridiculous. And um, actually, black's position is already pretty difficult. It's clearly not easy for black to handle this, and black does not have any advantage here already, even with the most you know proper play. But bishop c8 really makes black's position very dangerous, extremely dangerous, because now black is completely undeveloped, and you just castle queenside, and you have this overwhelming advantage in activity. And if they play e6, which is the most played move, then you're just crushing it right away. Let me show you how. So we've come to realize that if you play this gambit, which is technically called the von Popiel gambit, but I'd love to think about it as an, as an improved Black Mardimer gambit, here you're most likely to reach this position, and now your opponents will play pawn e6, or at least the majority of your opponents, and now you're simply crushing it with the most straightforward move, pawn d5. You have a huge lead in development, you're putting pressure here along this diagonal, now you're also about to open up the d-file and maybe even the e-file to attack opponent's underdeveloped army and you are completely killing it here. What can black do now? Well, they gotta somehow address this threat of pawn takes and uh, attack off the queen. If black captures here on d5, then it certainly doesn't help. Knight takes d5, we're strengthening the, the threat to this knight on f6 and not easy for black to cover that at all. Also, let's not forget that our rook is ready to hit the queen, so most of your pawns will play knight d7, trying to both cover uh, the queen as well as defend this knight from f6, but it fails to rook e1. Very simple move which wins the game. So in fact, you know, bishop e7 is forced, but now just rook takes, the rook is defended, and you are completely destroying black. So that doesn't work. Let's take a couple moves back and let's try to see if black can do anything else here. Alright, let's come back to this position. After pawn d5, instead of taking this pawn, what if black decides, okay, I'm gonna close the d-file that way by playing bishop d6. Then still you just keep going forward, keep attacking. Your moves are very natural. So again, like, even if you forgot some of the operations that I'm about to share, you just go forward, develop, and attack. It's very simple. So here you play knight e4, attacking this knight twice. And because of the pin, it can't move away. 
that four black would be forced to play knight d7. Now you can establish one more pin along this diagonal. And, you know, you can just see that your pressure is way too strong for black to handle across every possible angle. For example, if black takes here on d5, then you can take on f6, pawn takes, and bishop takes f6. Notice that there is a pin here, therefore the knight can never move, and you're just winning the game. So you're hitting the queen, and there's nothing black can do. If black takes on f6, they just lose the queen because queen takes, and the knight is still pinned. It's over. If black doesn't take, how can black defend the queen? If bishop e7, I mean, you can definitely take the rook, but if you want to humiliate black completely, completely, you can play rook e1. And now with all these pins, it's just really painful for black. And you can see how devastating your attack is going to be here. On the next move, you're going to capture over here and win the game. By the way, it's also a very universal gambit. And you can get there with different move order. For example, even strangely enough from the Scandinavian defense, it was supposed to be the Scandinavian, but if you play pawn d4, there we go, it's our stuff, right? Pawn takes, knight c3, and we transpose into what we're analyzing. Also, let's take it back. If black tries here the Karakan defense against e4, it's this, all the same stuff, d4, d5, knight c3, pawn takes, and now instead of recapture, you just play pawn of 3 and you once again transpose it into the stuff that we're analyzing. And in fact, I recorded a video just a couple of days ago covering this particular line, and you may wish to check this out later, because clearly you'll have all-around knowledge about uh, this opening if, if you're going to play it. All right, let's come back to the most usual move order. After pawn d4, pawn d5, we're sacrificing the pawn here, knight c3, we're attacking it, black defense, and now we'll play bishop g5. And it's actually quite a cool move for different reasons. First of all, your opponent thinks that you want to take the knight here and after that get your pawn back. And for that reason, black usually places their bishop to f5 here, which gives you extra temples in the future. But also, we already noticed that sooner or later black will need to move the e6 pawn to develop uh, their kingside pieces. But as soon as the pawn is moved here, it opens up this pin. And therefore, it's always unpleasant for black. Right, these are just some generalities. But let's come back to bishop f5, the main move. We play pawn f3 right now, uh, threatening to take here and then to get the pawn back. Black captures here, queen takes f3, hitting the bishop, hitting this pawn. And in the previous uh, game, we analyzed that black tried to bring their bishop all the way back to c8, trying to cover everything. But that was just way too passive and allowed white huge lead leading development and quick attack. What if black plays a seemingly better move pawn e6, just trying to still stay active at least? Well, then you can grab the pawn on b7, why not? You're also attacking the rook. So knight d7 is forced, and now you can play bishop b5, once again putting the second pin. So we already have one over here, and we're putting the other knight of black as well. And you can see how you start putting pressure here, and you're not even down a pawn anymore because you capture that pawn on b7. What can black do? Well, let's say bishop e7 or anything else. By the way, rook b8 just doesn't do anything. You can just happily win another pawn. That doesn't help black in any way. So if bishop e7, which seems like a better option, then you could just develop, but you can also take advantage of the fact that this rook is a little bit hanging temporarily, and you can instead take here on d7. Normally black would wish to capture with their queen, but now they can't because the rook is hanging. So that forces black to take on d7 with the knight. If the knight takes, then you take on e7, and black once again runs into the same problem. They can take it with the queen because the rook is hanging. And that forces the king to move instead, and as soon as black moves the king away, it becomes just centralized and vulnerable. And after that, you can just continue playing with simple moves. You simply castle queenside, and after that, your plan is to play knight of three, probably d5 at some point, and break through, attack the centralized king. Everything's really great. Now let's analyze the most challenging line for white. After you just played pawn f3, the most common move pawn takes is actually wrong, because it allows you to bring out your queen with a tempo, attacking here everything, and you're actually getting a great game. A better option for black instead of taking here is playing knight to d7. The other knight supports this knight on f6, and therefore, that eliminates white's threat of bishop takes here, eliminates the knight, and then wins the pawn back on e4. Now, if white takes here, which you shouldn't do, black would just replace one knight by the other one, and they're still defending this pawn on e4. So that's the point of the move knight to d7. 
Now, what can white do instead? Well, Stockfish here says that black is just better, black is a pawn up, and Stockfish recommends this move knight to d7. But the same Stockfish actually recommends a pretty cool line for white here, which is pawn g4. You just start expanding on the king side. And remember, in many variations here, we castle queen side. It's actually more common to castle queen side in this opening line. So we're not worried about moving our pawns forward here on the king side. It just supports our attack. So pawn g4, attacking the bishop. Bishop comes back, and now you play queen e2. Again, preparing queen side casting, and right now also renewing our threat to this pawn on e4. And again, theoretically, black can hold this position. You know, Stockfish can show you that after c6, black is better. But you know, it's very difficult, nearly impossible to figure it out on your own that c6 is the correct move here for black. And even if your opponent ever analyzed this position with Stockfish, which is highly unlikely, probably black will forget all these lines anyway, because again, it's pretty difficult to remember them. And this line pawn g4 followed by queen e2 is not the main variation anyway. So most likely your opponents will just see this position for the first time in their life. And if that's the case, they'll just take here on f3. You recapture, and now things are pretty cool. Once again, you're having this standard position where yes, you're pulling down, but you have huge lead in development, a lot of attacking ideas, and it's really difficult for black to figure out what to do. For example, if black just tries developing naturally, you castle queen side, bishop e7, and now there's a cool line where you can start playing pawn h4 and attacking here on the king side, threatening to capture the bishop. After black plays pawn h6, trying to stop this, there is again very beautiful sacrifice here, pawn h5. At first, it looks like you just blundered or miscalculated, because after pawn takes g5, it looks like black is just winning. Because if you recapture similarly, it just loses this rook on h1. Looks like you forgot that the rook is not defending. But in reality, you're actually winning here, so that's a trap. Even though black can win the rook, but their king is now in trouble. That's the trick. And you just start attacking it. So king takes f7, knight takes g5, check to the king, as well as we're attacking this pawn on e6. And this brings us basically a winning attack. So on the next move, you're going to probably capture on e6, either by knight or queen, and it's going to be devastating. For example, where can the move the king move? If it goes here, knight e6 is a fork. We're winning the queen, so that's bad for black. If king goes here, then there is just queen to e6, check. And now on the next move, queen f7 is coming if king goes here. If king goes uh, over there to h8, then there is knight f7, this fork. We're still winning. So let's take a couple moves back once again. You can just see that again, like your position is very strong. If king goes here, uh, 96 is the best move, but I guess that even if you take it with the queen, you'd probably win the game anyway, because you have this straightforward attack against opponent's king, it's really hard for black to stop it, but 96 is actually even stronger, queen goes here, and now, again, I think that in a real practical game, you can play different moves and you'll still win, if you play g5 or like uh, something like this, you, you may still win, or knight g7, but the best move is rook e1, so setting it up for the checkmate, you know, the next move when the knight goes away. And black is defenseless, because even though black is a rook up, their pieces are completely disorganized. They are somewhere on the edges, doing nothing really, and you're just attacking the king. Let's also take a look at a couple sidelines where black tries to get away from your black mardim or gamut. For example, what if black starts off with knight of 6 instead of pawn d5? If knight of 6, then you just play knight c3, preparing pawn e4, occupying the center, which forces black to play d5. And here, if you play pawn e4, I've just checked it in the database, the vast majority of players takes it here by the pawn, which just transposes into our usual stuff after, you know, bishop g5 followed by f3. What if black takes with the knight? Again, very few people will do that, but if they ever does, then, you, you know, you recapture here. And normally you wish to play f3, still transposing into our gambit stuff, but Stockfish recommends bishop e3 solidifying your center first, and it's actually a better idea. And on the next move, you're gonna play pawn f3, after a take, you recapture by the by the knight, then you bring out your bishop, you castle kingside, and you have an also an easy game and a very good compensation with your kingside attack. In fact, I'm gonna share with you another game right now, which shows you this plan in action. In this game, after pawn e4 and pawn takes, knight c3, knight f6, our usual stuff, bishop g5, instead of playing bishop to f5, black played knight d7, which is also a common move among stronger opponents. And what can you do then? Well, you still play pawn f3. 
Just after a pawn takes, instead of taking here with a queen, in this case it's easier to recapture by the knight, because previously we took by the queen because we wanted to hit the bishop over there on f5, right? And now there is no bishop there. Therefore, queen takes f3 wouldn't win a tempo, and we can just instead develop a knight with a tempo. And here after black continues development, pawn e6, bishop d3, bishop e7, and a new castle, king side, you have set it up for a nice attack over opponent's castling in the middle game. Black castles here, and you can easily notice that you've got this bishop pointing towards the castle and this bishop putting pressure along this diagonal. Also, you have the semi-open file for your rook, and therefore it's ready to join the party. Your knight can jump to e5, and you can easily see how all your pieces come together to attack opponent's castling. A very useful maneuver to remember is queen e1, where you want to shift your queen to the king side where it can support your attack. For example, if black goes pawn b6, aiming to thin cat of the bishop, or any other move, doesn't really matter, you bring your queen to h4, and actually, probably black's position is already lost, or at least it's extremely difficult to save it by this time. Now, your queen and bishop start to target this pawn on h7, Black never really wants to push it forward because you just play bishop takes h6 and you completely open up the position of the king and you're gonna checkmate it very soon. Therefore, that's not the solution. If black simply develops here bishop b7, then there are many ways for you to continue your attack. You could just play knight e5, very standard move, so that after that, when you bring your knight here, your rook comes into play and you want to eliminate this knight. And after that, deliver the checkmate, let me use another color, let, deliver the checkmate over there on h7. So 95 is a standard way. But in this particular case, instead of 95, you even have a straightforward win with bishop takes h7. It's not even a sacrifice in this case, because after knight takes, you've got bishop takes e7, and you win the exchange, and you keep your attack after that. Same with the same moves, 95 and all that stuff. So um, you can see that even if black plays similarly solid moves, you still have great compensation and great attacking opportunities in the middle game. In case you missed my previous video where I covered this opening, you may click over there and check it out right now, that would complement your knowledge. And if you want to know how to find proper attacking moves, especially in the middle game, then you may attend my free masterclass by clicking the link over there. Best of luck in your chess battles, and I'll talk to you soon.